Lord, just thank you. Thank you, you always speak to us. Our problem is half the time we're not listening. But Lord, just right now, as, uh, as I speak, Lord, I pray it's your words. And Lord, I pray that all of us, including myself, are listening this morning in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Wow, do you know, it's been, believe it or not, about five weeks since I last preached. Yeah, I know, I've been chilling. I've been sleeping in the office most days and um, really enjoyed myself. <laughs> if you believe that. So, hello, fellow Corinthians. Hello. So, if we remember, we're back to 1 Corinthians. Oh, yes, we are, Joyce. We're back to 1 Corinthians. So, you don't make little comments. I heckle back. So, we're back. And if we remember, the town of Corinth, or the city of Corinth, is no different from where we are today. There's sexual immorality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, actually, they've got us a sketch doing a sketch at Baptist Assembly. You're meant to cheer at one moment and go, mm, at another moment. So, no, don't do that. Um, it's made up of people from lots of different beliefs and religions. It's a real mixed bag, Corinth. It's no different from us. It's a society that has just got lots of different cultural values infiltrating it, and it infiltrates the church. Ta-da! Welcome to Greenford, 2015. So, we said it's got a lot to talk to us about it. Now, normally this is where I run around and go, can you remember from the last time so far what we have learned up until chapter 6, the end of chapter 6? Who's up for that? Shall I give you a few moments for your brains to... Do you know, memory is not the problem. It's recollections, the issue. It's true. You actually remember everything you've been told and you've seen and you've learned. The problem is our brains are not very good at recollecting. But there is something in the Bible that says the Holy Spirit reminds us. So, ready? Can anyone remember anything so far from the letter of 1 Corinthians that we have learnt together. This is boding well. There's one significant thing. Well, it's Chris, go on. They were willing to listen to anyone, sort of preachers coming from all sorts of uh, different angles and uh, taking on board some of their teachings. Thank you. Slide through. No, this way, it's easier. I'm not going to try and kick Wendy and Joy out of the way. We're God's own possession. Thank you. We are God's own possession. That's the key thing. That's the key thing. Isn't it? We are sanctified. We are holy. Now, present tense. Because of what Jesus done on the cross, if you've given your life over to Jesus, you are now sanctified. You are holy. Now, yes, we sin and we, we get it wrong. We know that. But we don't wallow in what we've made a mistake from. We learn from it, know we're forgiven and move on. Because we are sanctified. We are children of God. Now, it's not something we're waiting for. It's something that actually, through Jesus, God has said, now. It was that present tense, wasn't it, that was used right at the beginning by Paul in 1 Corinthians. And there's lots of other things. I was, uh, but I think that's the one thing I want us to really grasp and grab. Because out of that, out of that knowledge, out of that true belief and being a sanctified person, your relationship with God... And what you do for the Lord will be born out of all of that. The more you realize how much you are sanctified and how much God loves you, will actually stop you from doing wrong things because you're going to want to do what your father wants you to do. But it's born out of the relationship, not born out of rules and regulations. Does that make sense? And I'm really simplifying it deliberately at the moment. I'm sure some of us are going, yeah, what about? But it is out of the relationship that comes everything that you do. If you have a bad relationship with someone and they're a bad person, you'll follow them, wouldn't you? And you'll do the things that they do. Come on, let's all hark back to our childhood. I'm sure we can think of somebody at school. 
that we wanted to be like, and then after a while actually discovered they're not probably a very nice person. I probably shouldn't have followed that route. I'm clearly completely different, by the way. I just don't know. Where's mum? Oh, mum's there. Anyway, moving on. Um, so it's born out of your relationship with God. So there was also in this letter trying to get unity within the church. There's lots of different factions. I'm not going to go into it. We'll probably pick it up as we go along. There was lack of acceptance of the authority of the church leaders. Christ crucified is enough. Him crucified is enough. Our fumbling speech with the convictional power of the Holy Spirit is enough when you're giving your testimony, when you're trying to talk to somebody about the gospel. You don't have to be a Steve Williams. You don't have to be an evangelist. It's just your own personal story with the conviction of the Holy Spirit is enough. Wisdom of the world was infiltrating the church and they didn't even realize that it was happening. Church leaders are God's servants, not the church's. Church leaders are held accountable by God for the kind of church he, as in God, once built. We had kicking out the immoral brother and sister because their persistent sin was actually ruining the work of the church. Is this all slowly coming back? And uh, the last time was needing to use correct interpretation of the Bible. Whatever you design as correct interpretation. So, chapters 1 to 6 were the verbal reports that Paul had heard about, if you remember. And he was writing back into that. Remember, 1 Corinthians isn't really the first letter. It's more than likely 2 Corinthians. Do you remember all of that? Because there is two letters that we got missing, which is really 1 and 3 Corinthians, but we haven't got them. So we've actually got 2 and 4 Corinthians in reality. Confused? Good. Welcome. I'm trying to rush this a little bit because we've got 40 verses to go through. Yeah, it's a... So remember, with a letter, it's like listening to one half of a mobile phone conversation. We don't really know quite fully what's going on the other end. So chapters one to six were the verbal reports. And now, seven to the end, is Paul responding to the questions that they had written about in a letter. Okay? But unfortunately, we don't have that letter. So it's still like listening to the other half of a telephone conversation. which still on public transport is really annoying. One of these days, I will sit next to somebody and lean up against. And then after a while, they go, what are you doing? Well, so I can listen to the other half. I'm listening to yours, clearly. <laughs> <clears throat> right, that's enough of my own soapbox. Let's move on. Let's read uh, verses 1 to 6. Now, regarding the questions you asked in your letter. See, I told you. Starts with the letter. Yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. That's it, you're all eunuchs. We're leaving it there, thank you, and no. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. The husband should fulfill his wife's sexual needs and the wife should fulfill her husband's needs. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband gives authority over, to, over his body to his wife. Do not deprive each other of sexual relations unless you both agree to refrain from sexual intimacy for a limited time, so you can give yourselves more completely to prayer. Afterward, you should come together again so that Satan won't be able to tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. Okay, now, chapter 7, it does not just talk to married couples, which we will find out as we continue, okay? Some of this is fairly obvious. I, sexual immorality is rife in Corinth. 
people running off to prostitutes, temple prostitutes, se extramarital sex outside of marriage, and lot. I mean, I could list it all out, but you're with me on this, aren't you? You know what I'm talking about. And it would appear from this letter that there are clearly some within the Corinthian church who are saying now, because there is just so much bad sex going on, if you've become a Christian, abstain from sex completely. Even if you're in a marital relationship, abstain. Stop having sex full stop. And later on, um, we will see Paul talking about maybe not getting married at all. But we'll take it from there. But of course, Paul, as a good Jewish uh, Genesis believing uh, uh, teacher, is saying, well, no, hang on a minute. Sex between a man and woman in the sanctity of marriage has been ordained by God. There's nothing wrong with it. Did you know in medieval times, actually, that um, the church so believed that sex was so wrong that they believed that when a man or woman are having sex, the Holy Spirit would leave? And then when they finished, the Holy Spirit would return. I don't want to know what that comment was. But therefore, Paul would find this teaching absolutely ridiculous. If we could just zoom on that. No. <laughs> so actually, for Paul, the best way to combat the sexual immorality that is happening in the city and that is obviously infiltrating the church, because remember, the Christians were going off and doing their own thing as well. They were deciding that, uh, remember, they have this belief that the body is bad. Anything that happens to the body is irrelevant because it's going to die. And actually, it's the divine spark in you that needs to be released from the bad body. So whatever you do in the flesh doesn't make any difference to your salvation. And Paul's obviously trying, he's already combating that, that teaching and saying, well, that's not true. So they're off having sex and they really don't think. They're taking on their world's culture and think it's okay to do so. But Paul is saying, no, 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 no. The best way to combat sexual immorality is a man to have his own wife and a wife to have her own man. Or a woman to have her own man. Now, I want you to note, I don't know if you've noticed this, but actually the same comment, exactly the same words, are used for each sex. Like this, the wife gives authority over her body to her husband. And the husband gives authority over his body to his wife. It's absolutely parallel. There's no discrimination for Paul. It's equal. Why? The idea is to fulfill each other's sexual needs so that they won't go straying off. And by the way, before everybody sits there and thinks, oh yeah, typical geezers, notice it's to both. Just thought I'd mention that in passing. A joke. It's so obvious in the press. Always it's the man that seems to be the one that goes and does the running away. It happens both camps. So where Paul is talking about here is authority over each other's body. It's around sort of the concept of marriage vows. You become one flesh once you're married. Your body is not your own once you have become married. Do you remember the Corinthians are absolutely addicted to rights? It's my right. Do you remember then how I said, gosh, isn't that no different from us today? It's my right, this is. Well, they have the same thing. It's my body. I have a right to do with it as I please. And Paul is saying, well, actually, in the sanctity of marriage, that's not quite strictly true because you become one flesh. It's okay, by day. I'm getting to you later. By day's getting married soon, isn't she? <clears throat> so you're listening? Excellent. Paul is saying you are not to lord or lady it over your own body. Your partner has an equal share in it. It's interesting, isn't it? In verse 5, do not deprive each other of sexual relations. That word deprive is actually do not, more like better to say do not defraud. 
Do not fraudulently withhold sexual relations from your partner. Do not try and worm out of it. Try and demand your rights that it's your body to try and convince them. I don't know, what's the modern day term? I have a headache this evening, darling. I don't know. But, you know, how true is that? Hmm? I'm not, I'm, I'm not talking, by the way, I am not giving one example from my own marriage, all right? I just thought I'd make this very clear. Goodness me. There are multiple reasons for that. Clearly, I like my life as it is, okay? I'm not ready to meet the Lord Jesus just yet. So, but it's a deliberate play on words, because if you remember earlier on, Paul's having a go at them about suing each other. Do you remember that? Going to courts and suing each other? It's the same thing here. He's saying, hang on a minute, don't defraud each other. Don't try and con each other out. You're worrying why you've got problems. Well, this is part of the problem. If, if the married couples are denying each other, and especially if they think it's some good biblical teaching, yeah, you're defrauding. You with me so far? And Paul is saying, don't deny each other. Because... Well, don't defraud each other. Don't try and con each other out of it. You are to fulfill your God-given sanctity to each other. Your body is not your body, and it's also not their body. Now, let's make this very clear, just very quickly. This does not mean, clearly here, that Paul is saying, should one not be in the mood, right, that you go and force yourself on the other one by saying, well, it's my right. It says so in the Bible. That's a load of baloney all right if you're in good enough love open communication relationship you should be able to mutually agree now the problem is trying to do this sort of thing in in a a very rapid way in a very uh, blanket manner is you're not going to cover all pastoral situations and all relational situations okay so you're going to have to think for yourself those who are currently married but clearly this is not about the fact you can demand sex from your partner just because it says so in the bible okay this is actually talking maybe to the person who's doing the defrauding and they know in themselves if they're denying their partner and also for here again talked about paul equality in marriage but by the way the fact that paul says it's both the husband and the wife have got to marry up is actually quite revolutionary Paul is fairly well known amongst the church as a male chauvinist he wasn't and this is clear proof because actually he believed in the equality in marriage absolute equality and actually that was revolutionary for his day because it was the male that had complete head of the family and could do pretty much what he wanted There are some now giggling, and maybe they're saying, well, that's not true. You know it's yet you, darling, my wife, who has the head of the whole household. But in Paul's day, to talk about equality was revolutionary. So if you've got something against Paul, because he talks about women needing to be silent in church, unpack what he means by that first, rather than just assuming he's being male chauvinistic, because he's not. We'll come to that another time in life. So five to six, now there is only one way, there's only one reason for not having sex, and that's to devote yourselves to prayer, together. Paul's idea is, well, if you can physically come together, there's no reason why you can't spiritually come together. And for Paul, it's almost like a form of fasting. It's when it's, there's a big deal going on. There's something you really want to pray about. Now, normally, you know, when there's something big that you really want to say to God, I'm really serious about this. I'm actually, I'm going to fast and pray about it while I'm fasting. For here, for Paul, it's the same thing, that the couple come together and say, Do you know, this is something we're really serious about. And actually, where we would normally have sex, let's actually abstain and pray instead about this situation. It's a form of fasting. Yeah? It's quite interesting, isn't it? But what he's saying, it should be for a limited time. And actually, both of you need to agree to it. 
Now let's try and understand what he means by agree. This is not just an agree where you sit there and you have a conversation across dinner and say, this is serious, isn't it? Yeah, this is serious. Well, I think we really need to be serious about this in our spiritual praying. And so what we need to do is abstain. And you just firmly nod, go, yeah, 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 yeah. It's about spiritual agreement. It's about actually genuinely agreeing between the two of you. There is a sense that you're both picking up the fact that you need to do this. It's something that God is saying to you both very clearly. And the reason he's using that sort of on the same spiritual plane, same agreement, is because it's so easy for the super spiritual one in the relationship to impose the idea of not having sex because they don't want to have it. It's got nothing to do with actually really wanting to pray. They're imposing their own super spirituality over it. Do you, do you see what I mean? I, I, it could be, and I've got to be very, it could be that one person in the relationship is sort of the super Christian. I, I don't know where that term comes from. But the other partner thinks that the other partner is more spiritual than they are. But actually, that's normally because the one who's so supposedly more spiritual is the one who seems to be able to say all the right words at the right time, not necessarily in the right spirit. And Paul is saying here, what you need to do is explain. Because the lesser partner will just agree to it and then struggle with the fact that actually they're not having any sex and might go off and stray. With me so far? Okay. And of course, he's sort of saying, well, this, uh, this needs to happen. You need to agree, but it's only for a limited time. And afterwards, make sure you come back together so that Satan doesn't have a field day. Do you know, Satan doesn't care about you one jot. He really doesn't. He's not bothered by you at all. You personally, as a person, couldn't give a hoot. His whole job is to hurt God, to get God's kingdom. The only time he affects us and has a go at us is actually when we're doing God's work. When we're really sort of going for it. And he's suddenly thinking, oh, hang on a minute, not having this. So if it's a married couple that are doing it, or one partner within the married couple really doing it, what's the best way to start upsetting things let's start upsetting the relationship let's put some temptation in the way shall we let's get the weak points so here for Corinth for this particular community the best way is to see the one partner disappear off to go and have some extramarital relations and therefore then Temptation has got in the way and has bred into sin. And then it destroys the relationship, doesn't it? And so there's no harmony as such. There's no sense of praying and everything else. And so it really causes strife. So he's saying, so only do it for a limited time and then come back together again. Now, the question is probably going through most people's heads. Well, how often is regular? That's between you and your spouse to discuss to be open about, to chat. I'm not here giving you that sort of advice. It's down to you to discuss. There was some, uh, in some of the commentaries, there were some uh, 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 writings from that period where they were discussing how often, and there was actually legislation and rules about how often you should do it. If you was a traveling type salesman, you got off of, well, clearly you could only do it when you were back. So maybe it was once a month or once every two months. But if you lived and worked in the, uh, in, in the town, it was uh, two to three times a week. But I'm not making that legislation. So you discuss it between your spouse, that's it. Thank you very much. But part of this is, if you are denying your partner, you're going to let Satan have a field day within your relationship. Sex was created by God for a reason. Not just procreation, by the way. So therefore then, in our society, I, I still remember the old joke that I'm refusing my husband's sex because he's not done the DIY today. 
or he's not done the cooking, or he's not done the housework, he's not done whatever I've done, and it's the old age punishment. I shall refrain from having because you haven't. And half the time it was used as blackmail. Well, as an old joke, it's fine, but it can work both ways. And Paul here is saying, don't do that. You're going to let Satan have a field day in your relationship. That's enough of that. So, Paul carries on. But I wish everyone were single, just as I am. Oh, by the way, sorry, the concession, verse 6, sorry, I forgot. The concession, not a command, is about fasting for prayer. It's not about not having sex. That's, that is a command. What he's talking about here is if you wish to uh, abstain for a while uh, to pray about something as a couple, that's the concession, not the command, okay? That's, that's the concession, not command. The command is you should be having, not denying each other. Anyway, verse 7. But I wish everyone was single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. So I say to those who aren't married and to widows, it's better to stay unmarried, just as I am. But if they can't control themselves, they should go ahead and marry. It's better to marry than to burn with lust. I wish everyone was single, just as I am. Yet each person has a special gift from God of one kind or another. Please note here that the ability to remain single and the ability to be married is an equal gift from God. They're both gifts from God. Was Paul always single? It's normally assumed that Paul was single. But it's debatable very much. Firstly, Paul was a rabbi. And for rabbis, it was highly unusual to be unmarried. And to really make it worse, in Acts 26, verse 10, Paul refers to exercising his rights to vote in the proceedings of the Sanhedrin. Well, to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you would have to have been married. It's interesting, isn't it? Maybe Paul was widowed, because he makes a lot of reference to widows here. And he's elected to remain single. Maybe he was divorced by his wife because he converted to the way. We don't know. But it does shed some new light on the man Paul. Just thought I'd throw that in the pot. So don't always assume that he's talking from a man who's never been married. The reason to stay unmarried, well... That we'll unpack later on as to why he thinks it'd be better to stay unmarried. But the burning lust here that he talks about is better to be married than to burn with lust is not about running around sort of having sex just whenever you like it. It's actually more of the idea that you're so consumed with the idea of having sex and because you're single, you're not having it. You're so consumed, so focused on it that actually you're no good for the Lord. You're not thinking about anything else but having sex. It's forefront of your mind. Wherever you're walking, wherever you're doing, whether you're going to sleep, whatever else, you're thinking about nothing but sex. It sort of... Now, that doesn't mean it's like constant, constant, but it's that sense of you know that you're always torn on a minute-by-minute basis. You may not be having sex, but it's always there at the front of your mind. So Paul is saying, go get married. Where's 10? What's happened to it? Oh, there. But for those who are married, I have a command that comes from me. Sorry, not from me, but from the Lord. A wife must not leave her husband. But as she does leave him, let her remain single or else be reconciled to him. And the husband must not leave his wife. 
Now, I will speak to the rest of you, though I do not have a direct command from the Lord. If a Christian man has a wife who is not a believer, and she is willing to continue living with him, he must not leave her. And if a Christian woman has a husband who is not a believer, and he is willing to continue living with her, she must not leave him. Notice the parallel, same command to each. For the Christian wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the Christian husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but now they are holy. But if the husband or wife, who isn't a believer, insists on leaving, let them go. In such cases, the Christian husband and wife is no longer bound to the other, for God has called you to live in peace. Don't you wives realize that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realize that your wives might be saved because of you? Right at the beginning, it would appear, for those who are married, I have a command that not comes from me, but from the Lord, a wife must not leave her husband. But if she does leave him, she must remain single or else be reconciled to him. And then you've got this sort of subtext, and the husband must not leave his wife. We believe somewhere in the letter there's a very strong possibility that somebody was writing that this wife wanted to leave her husband because she thought sex was so evil that she needed the best way to abstain from it was to come out of the marriage completely. Okay? And Paul is saying, well, no, 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 you don't do that. You don't leave your spouses. So he's sort of directly maybe talking to the woman who's been reported of wanting to leave her Christian marriage because she thinks the sex is evil and that's the only way to get out of it. And then, of course, Paul is then just re-emphasizing, by the way, the same teaching works for the husband as well. This is not entirely about just leaving your other half. This is it talking into a particular context and a particular pastoral situation that is going on, which is the teaching around Corinth seems to be sex is evil because of the sexual morality, abstain completely. And some people think, well, the only way I can do that is to leave my partner, in this case, my husband. You with me? And Paul's saying, no, 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 don't do that. For Paul, um, and for the teaching that he says is from the Lord, he recognizes that there's actually only one basis for divorce between two Christian partners. That's we see in Matthew chapter 5, verse 32, and 19, verse 9. And that's extramarital sexual relations. relations. Fornication. And what's all wrapped up in pornia, in, uh, in the whole running off, and basically having sex elsewhere, having adultery elsewhere. In Matthew, that ever seems to be the only teaching is about that allows for divorce between two Christian partners. Now, Paul isn't stupid. If he even mentions in his teaching that this is a reason that you can get divorced, in a city, in a church where extra sexual relationships is rife, what do you think is going to happen? Everybody's going to divorce each other under that reason. So he doesn't mention it. But Paul is also a pastor, and he recognizes that all avenues of pastoral counseling, face-to-face marriage guidance, and all of those have to be tried before divorce even becomes the final say-so. You try for reconciliation, don't you? But Paul also later on that actually marriages come to an impasse and there's a point you just can't seem to repair them for one reason or another. And what he's saying actually, if you do leave your husband, then you have to stay. And it's also, by the way, it relates to the same. If the husband leaves as well, okay? The two are the same. If you do leave your partner, then you remain signal, single. Signal. I am tired from yesterday. I am so sorry. Because this is really tough teaching. This is not the easiest because I do recognize, you know, we're all in different situations. And, uh, you know, this is not the easiest thing to say. But that's what it says. You remain single then. 
because in, in God's sight, spiritually, you are bound to your partner. It's not easy. So again, I come back to the fact that I've said this blanket teaching doesn't help here on a Sunday morning because each person's situation, each person's situation has different pastoral connections and you have to unpack each person's different situations together. You do that on a one-to-one basis. So if you're sitting here this morning thinking, (gasps) or whatever I've done, something wrong, do not walk out of here just thinking that because each person's situation, why they're divorced, why they're single, why they're married, is different. And we take each one at its, at its value, at its situation. Do you understand me? With me? Okay. I knew when I was putting this together, this was not going to be the easiest of teaching. Now, 12.13... Talking about one partner becoming a Christian, the other one isn't. Now, it's interesting, isn't it? The Christian's not allowed to leave the marriage. If the non-believing partner is quite happy for it to continue. Now, you'll be sitting there thinking, well, why would that even need to be there? Well, let's think about it just for a minute. I'll talk about me, not my marriage. This was pre marriage. This is when I was single, okay? I became a Christian in my early 20s, yes? Prior to that, you all know I was, you know, didn't go to church. Goodness me, what was the most radical thing about becoming a Christian? Suddenly I was part of a church family. Suddenly I'm going to church every Sunday. Suddenly I'm doing things in the week in church. Now, if I'm single, cool. Cool. I got me and me to answer to. Unless, of course, my mum and dad wanted me to clean my room, wanted me to come back home. You think I'm joking? I'm still living with them. So you suddenly get drawn into doing stuff within church. Evangelism, you start talking. And one of the key things, though, that happens is that you want to talk about this new friend that you've got called Jesus. And when you're making decisions, you're meant to be referring to your Lord Jesus, aren't you? So in a marriage, all of a sudden, one partner has got this new, a third person effectively has come into the relationship. And his name is Jesus. So the Christian partner, always when they're making decisions, is probably saying, hang on a minute, I want to talk to Jesus about this first before I come back to you. Yeah? And the values of the Christian may start changing as well. Which then affects the relationship. Because the non-believer says, well, we only did this last week. Why can't we do that sort of thing again? Well, actually, this is not what God wants me to do. This goes against teaching. This is not the right thing. You make up your own mind what it is. So you can see the effect it will have in a relationship. So you can imagine after a while that the non-believing partner is going, "Uh uh-uh, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm having none of this. I'm out. But the Christian can't go. I'm out. You've got to stay in the relationship. But if your non-believer wishes to leave, then let them leave. And you're not bound to them afterwards because they're the ones who have done the divorcing. They're the ones who have done the leaving, not you. Okay, so there is a very... And again, I come back to each pastoral situation. Is, is, it depends upon the merits of each one. But it seems to be a teaching here that says if the non-believer leaves, the Christian partner hasn't got to worry about marrying somebody else. They may be allowed to do so because it's not them that did the leaving. But as I said, each situation is different. Each situation. So don't go running out of here and leaving. If you've got a non-believing partner, don't run out and think you can... And again, if we remember for this, this is not a direct command from the Lord. This is Paul was saying, I think this is 
this makes good sense to me. This makes good sense in the spirit. He's not saying this is a direct command. And sometimes I'll actually find with most pastoral situations, most situations, most interpretations, it's about us sitting there talking between us and talking to God. You know, the leadership team, when we come together make decisions, we don't sit there and just sort of wait for God to tell us directly, you know. Sometimes that does happen. But sometimes it's in our discussions and, and, and batting things around that we hear God together. Our members' meetings are about that. So it's the same thing with all pastoral situations. And then, yeah. By the way, don't think I go running off to the leadership team about your pastoral situation all the time, okay? Now, note the holiness to marriage that Paul is talking about, or in other translations, consecration. There seems to be this, this teaching that goes around, and it comes from this passage. For the Christian wife brings holiness to her marriage, and the Christian husband brings holiness to his marriage. Otherwise, your children would not be holy, but they are holy. Uh, No, it's not there. Let me go back one. There is 14, isn't it? Yes, there is. There is. There seems to be some teaching that says, don't panic if your partner is an unbeliever because they're saved through you being a believer. That's not what this is saying. This is not what this is saying. In Corinth, there was this strange understanding within the church that the unbelieving partner, their spirit, is cancelling out the believer partner's spirit, i.e. they're coming together and they're cancelling each other out. So there's no holiness in the marriage. That's the belief that appears to be going on here. And what Paul is combating here is saying, no, 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 no. You who are a believer, you who are a Christian with the Holy Spirit living in you, you are bringing sanctity into the marriage. You are bringing holiness into the household. Doesn't mean the other partner's saved, but you are bringing that. I.e., it comes to me 1 John 4. 4. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So actually the Holy Spirit in you, in your marriage, is overtaking the Spirit that is in the other person. There is no cancellation. You, the spirit that's living in you, is so much more powerful that you're bringing holiness. You're bringing a special connection for your household between you and God. And while you're there bringing that connection, your, that Holy Spirit, into the household, you are affecting the non-believer. How do you think you all became Christians if you are here? You came in not because you got convinced. You got here because the Holy Spirit working in you through your partners, through your friends, working in you. You didn't make the choice. Jesus chose you. You just went, oh, yeah, hello. Oh, I'll accept that. And that's the difference. So here this teaching is wrong. It's not the... Not the Paul teaching, but this concept of the non-believer is saved. That, because how does that reg register that we've all got to make our own decisions to follow Jesus for ourselves? But if you've got a non-believing partner in your relationship, the spirit that's in you will be affecting and working on them all of the time. Hence, Paul's then quote... Don't you wives realise that your husbands might be saved because of you? And don't you husbands realise that your wives might be saved because of you in the way that you are leading your life? The way that you are clearly changing. The spirit in you is going to be working on the spirit in them. You with me? Do you know we're really pleased we're not going to get through all 40 verses today? I'll mention it now. And next week when I'm doing it, I'm going to be asking questions, not at the beginning, but throughout the entire teaching, okay? 
So I'm going to want some answers back just today because Paul sort of tends to repeat himself a little bit in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 as he goes on and to re-emphasize something. So next week there's going to be uh, some key questions I'm going to ask and I expect responses. So by the way, that's not an excuse for you now not to come next week. Okay. Verse 17 to 24. Each of you should continue to live in whatever situation the Lord has placed you and remain as you were when God first called you. This is my rule to all churches. For instance, a man who was circumcised before he became a believer should not try to reverse it. And the man who was uncircumcised when he became a believer should not be circumcised now. For it makes no difference whether or not a man has been circumcised. The important thing is to keep God's commandments. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. Are you a slave? Don't let that worry you. But if you get a chance to be free, take it. And remember, if you were a slave when the Lord called you, you are now free in the Lord. And if you were free when the Lord called you, you are now a slave to Christ. God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. Each of you, dear brothers and sisters, should remain as you were when God first called you. Well, this is about status in society. Remain as you were when God called you. Are you married? Stay married. Were you a slave? Stay a slave. Unless, of course, an opportunity arises to you to be free. Now, we must recognize that Paul is talking into a particular situation. He's talking into a particular time and place. So slavery back then had completely different meaning within the Jewish context, completely different meaning to what it means today or our understanding of it today, yes? So I would most certainly never use this passage to try and tell a fellow Christian slave, don't seek to escape. Just remain as you are. That's just... Do you know, over the centuries, the Bible has been so misused. Anyway... And don't think we don't abuse it today, neither. There are some in the church who are saying that you must be circumcised, and others are saying you must reverse your circumcision. Goodness me, what an absolute farce. Talk about, could you imagine this? Is this camp saying you must be circumcised, and there's this camp over there going, no, you must reverse it. How do you reverse it, by the way? Anyway, get the staple gun out. I'm sorry, I, c I couldn't resist. If, um, if you was offended by that. Yeah, well, anyway. Right, so. <laughs> it's life. Um, so, I, I am curious to know how, you, anyway. Moving on. Uh, could, could you imagine the surgery? That, that, anyway. Uh, I, yeah, I'm moving on, I'm moving on. But Paul is saying it makes no odds whether you've been circumcised or not circumcised. You're now in Christ, and therefore you are all one. You are all God's own possession. It makes no odds. Just because you were a Gentile that wasn't circumcised, you don't need to be like the Jews who are circumcised. It, that they're, they're showing of the fact that they are Jews and therefore they're part of God's people makes them no different anymore because you're both part of God's people because of what Christ did on the cross. That's the point. Saying, don't be rude. Could you imagine that in the church? Oh, the ridiculousness of that combating. I hate to see their members' meetings. Anyway. Verse 20. Can be very much applied to us today. Yes, each of you should remain as you were when God called you. 
Now, as I said, this is all just about status within society. So let's apply it to ourselves today slightly. When you become Christians, you realize you're set free, amen? And you start looking at the world very differently, amen? Slowly but surely, your eyes become more and more opened to A, the things that are wrong, B, your life, and you start looking at your life. And you start thinking to yourself, hmm, am I actually doing anything that's worthwhile for God? Don't you? You start examining the things that you should be doing for God. And normally what then tends to happen is sometimes we actually start then looking at our jobs, if we have a job. And start thinking to ourselves, oh, well, I, I want to go and do something worthwhile. I want to go and be a missionary. Nothing wrong with that. I want to go in to work for the church. It's that sort of thing that happens to a lot of Christians when they first come to Christ. And within about a year, they suddenly realize they want to go and do God's work in the church. Paul is saying, no, 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 your status now is when God called you. And he's called you to know him where you are. Remain where you are. Remain in your relationships. Remain in your workplaces. Because it's there that he called you. So why do you think he might have called you there? To be his person there. To be his voice there. To be his child there. Remain. We get itchy feet. We start seeing the futility of what we're doing on a nine-to-five job. You're right. It is. Half of it, quite frankly, in the grand scheme of eternity, is going to mean absolutely nothing. Doing those calculation figures on the accounts books are going to mean nothing in the grand scheme of eternity. Isn't that correct, correct to me? Good, he's silent. Selling used cars, believe you me, absolutely means nothing because they break down and burn up and become flames. I'm talking about myself here. Now, before you then think, oh, well, Pastor Warren, look, you got out and you went into Christian ministry. I came in here kicking and screaming, my brothers and sisters, not into the church, but into ministry. Okay? It was definitely not something I was chomping at. But the relationships you have where you are, the connections you have, the ability to, the spirit in you taking over the spirit in the other person and connecting with them and changing them, the Holy Spirit in you affecting the person next to you, in your workplace, in your colleges, in your schools, in your family, in your homes, wherever you are, in the job centers, wherever you are, that is the significance of why you're there. That is why you are to remain as you are. That puts the significance into where you are when you realize that your job is to be a minister there. We're all royal priests, amen? So therefore then, royal priests work where they are. If you've got a relationship with a partner who is not a Christian, your spirit will affect them. It may take years. But at some point, and they can't deny it, they've got to change. Your work colleague, who is the most difficult work colleague in the world, the spirit in you will start affecting them. Your company as a whole might just be absolutely oh, getting on your nerves. You never, never, never seems to move forward. It looks like it's just about to change. And whatever else, I don't know, you've got all the right number of staff in there. And all of a sudden, somebody moves on, that, that they change it around, they keep swapping it around. But your spirit will affect what's going on. Remain as you are. 
When God wants to move you out, he will make it abundantly clear. When you pray about it, when you start spending time with those that are close to you, asking them the question to pray about it to give you answers, you come maybe and see moi and ask me to bat it around with you. God will make it abundantly clear. I can only tell you my own story. I knew for me, God was making it abundantly clear for me for about two years. Every time I went into the Bible to look at a passage, Lord, talk to me about my future. Where should I be going? What should I be doing? It kept on talking about Levites and priests and pastors. Shut the book. Let's go to Revelation. That's a lot easier. I didn't get out of Genesis chapter 1 for ages because I didn't want to go any further. I do enjoy what I do because it's how I'm gifted and it... So hear me carefully, don't sit there and think, he hates being here, that's not true. But I'm just explaining, sometimes when you're denying something for ages, you know what I mean? But some of us can get itchy feet and think that's where we should be going, and God's going, no, 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 no. Remain where you are. There I can use you. So I don't know about your situation, but look at it and think, in God's eyes, what's the significance of where I am today? What difference can I make? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31 says, do all things to the glory of God. And that's, I think, to me, as I said right at the beginning of this teaching originally, that actually is the key verse in here. Everything's done for the glory of God. So be in a relationship, do it for the glory of God. Later on next week, be looking at being single, you do it for the glory of God. Having sex, you do it for the glory of God. Remaining in your job, for the glory of God. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we recognize that um, the teaching of Paul and the teaching of the Bible doesn't have a quick answer all for everybody when it comes to difficult relational situations. It has an answer, but it can't be just immediately snapped to like that. Sometimes we have to discuss and debate and listen to your spirit. But Father, we do recognize that all of these things are to be for your glory. And Lord, I want to pray each of us in here this morning that maybe has found it hard this morning given their situation at this time. Lord, I want to pray for your spirit to be working on them. Where there is real hammering of the head at the moment, Lord, that is condemnation. That is not of you. I ask, Lord, that you help cease that. Lord, I pray for all marriages that they will know you right at the center. They will give you the center. I pray for all friendships, Lord, that again, you are at the center. In the name of your son, we pray, amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.